the gateway to the West, Cardinal Nation. St. Louis, Missouri is home to some of the most brilliant doctors in the world. These doctors are pushing science to its limits, healing patients in new, innovative ways, and doing it at the same time they're teaching the next generation of doctors how to save lives. Meet SLU Care physician, Dr. Mikulek, who restores hearing in babies who might otherwise be profoundly deaf. Dr. Godbon, who restores sight in children who are losing their vision. And Dr. McGenty, who helps children walk normally after they are born with clubfoot. This is the science of healing. Can you point to where your baby brother is? Thanks. Oh. We are going to have a baby, a little boy. I get referrals through our fetal care institute. When a mom has had an ultrasound, usually around 20 weeks, everything with his organs and everything else was fine. They just thought that his right foot was just a little crooked. Many times we can already see the feet, the hands, the legs formation. If there's any sort of subtle changes that suggest that a child may have a club foot, they'll be referred to me. And so I get to see families right at the middle of their pregnancy and talk to them. I go through a series of teaching points with them, what club foot is, what to expect when they first see their baby. We go through some pictures of what a club foot looks like and then we talk about the treatment. Whenever we left, I was very comfortable with the plan we had in place and the care that he was going to get. I had all the faith in the world with Dr. McGinty. She was so informative. We had our own little personal room at the Fetal Care Institute and everyone came to us and she was great. She had a little model of a baby foot and a little cast, tiniest little cast you've ever seen. We have no idea necessarily what causes clubfoot. We do know that we have some wonderful treatments for clubfoot now. and th This is not a debilitating disease anymore. This is not something that's going to stop them from being a football player like Troy Aikman from the Dallas Cowboys who also had club feet, uh, Christina Yamaguchi. So a lot of times dads are really afraid that their child may not walk or play sports and moms are just afraid of pain or any issues that may look make their child look different and so again it's really nice just to be able to speak with them allay some of those fears and let them know kind of what to expect so september 21st we were induced for liam he was born at 802 p.m he was seven pounds two ounces and 20 inches long uh, labor was super easy. Delivery was really easy. I pushed three times and it was over. It didn't look like what I was expecting at all. I don't really know what I was expecting, but it wasn't bad at all. Like, you didn't even really notice it. The doctor looked him over and said, yeah, he has a club foot and you'll follow up with at Cardinal Glenn. And after about 18 hours after delivery, the nurse practitioner came in and listened to his heart and said that he had a heart murmur. And so they took him to the nursery for x-rays and some tests. They called Cardinal Glennon through um, video conference and talked with one of the NICU physicians and they decided to bring Liam to Cardinal Glennon. We listened to the murmur and thought that there was some concern for a valve or abnormality and we did a specialized test called an ultrasound of the heart and saw the problem with the aortic valve. It was terrifying. We, you know, just had a baby. You have a lot of emotions with that anyways. And then they take him to another room and run all these tests and IVs and just all sorts of stuff was it was fast. Everything happened really quickly. It's not uncommon. About one in a hundred babies will have some type of heart defect, but some of those babies will have more significant defects that need intervention soon after birth or in, the, in early infancy. The cardiologist came in and said that he has aortic stenosis and that they would most likely have to do surgery to correct that a heart cath, um, but they would present it to their whole team Monday morning and then come and let us know what was going to happen. Usually we'll use this uh, catheter with a small balloon on it. This is all done under x-ray guidance and the catheter is placed across the valve, inflated to open up that valve further and then everything's taken out and usually the recovery period is not that long but since he was here as a little baby we had to monitor and make sure his feeding was okay afterwards and that he tolerated things fine. 
So he came back, they, all of the doctors came in and let us know how it went, everything, they said everything went well. Um, they were pleased with the procedure and he did fine coming off the medication. He started moving and making noises and whenever the doctors came in to do rounds, they took him off the ventilator. He did well coming off the vent for a little while and then he quit breathing. His oxygen went down to 30%, I think. They had to bag him a couple of times. He just wouldn't wake up. He just would not wake up from the anesthesia. So it was four or five hours, I think, of trying different things and so many staff members coming into the room and at one point, I think there were three or four doctors in there, and I don't know how many nurses, and they were just trying to come up with a solution on how to get this little baby to wake up, and, and they decided to give him Narcan, and as soon as they put that drop in his IV, his little eyes popped open and his hands came up, and he was awake. But that that was the toughest part. The Him not waking up was the hardest part of all of it, even though you could tell that something wasn't going right, but there was no panic at all from any of the staff. It was very calm and, I mean, it, the people that were in the room trying to help him were brilliant and would tell us everything and talk to us in ways that we understood it because neither one of us have any medical background. So um, they would explain it to us in ways that, so we knew what was going on. and. Even though it was terrifying, I knew he was in good hands the whole time. Everybody who works here is really looking out for the patients, and so I think there's just a sense of professionalism between staff, physicians, and it takes all of us to really help families feel comfortable. He was fine. He was just a real baby again. <laughs> I think his prognosis is very good. The aortic valves can sometimes require intervention again, sometimes during early infancy when they're growing and the valve doesn't quite grow as quickly as they are. Uh, so the family's aware of that and we'll watch him closely, but hopefully long term, he'll always need to come in and check in with the cardiologist, but hopefully can still grow up and do all the normal things that kids do. Dr. McGinty's team came in, went into the room whenever we were in the NICU and examined his club foot and said, you know, follow up in a couple of weeks, give yourselves some time, give him some time to go home and relax and come back in a couple weeks and we'll start on the club foot. Today we are at Cardinal Glennon. We came in this morning and went to the club foot clinic and met with Dr. McGinty's physician's assistant and they put on his first little cast. He's all bundled up then. So he has his first of five casts. He did great through that, slept through the whole thing, ate a bottle through it. It wasn't near as bad as what I was expecting either. It was really quick and we'll come back every week for the next five weeks and get a new cast. Club foot treatment is absolutely amazing to me and it really is non-surgical. We do a series of casts where we gently manipulate the foot between those casting sessions where we gently really are able to stretch the foot to a normal position. And we hold those positions, that stretched position with casts. It takes about five casts. And there is a small procedure between the fourth and fifth cast where we um, are actually cut the Achilles tendon, which grows back in, in, young, in young babies to allow the foot to be corrected fully. And then afterwards, there's some bracing that has to occur that in general, kids wear some sort of brace, um, usually at nighttime until they're about five years old. So we have a nice graduation party right before kindergarten uh, that allows them to go forward, no more bracing at night. And so it's a lot of fun, but it's just amazing to see a family who's afraid that a child won't walk. And we know that if it's not treated, this can really affect them for a lifetime. It'd be a very painful deformity and disability causing um, a problem. But to see kids run into the clinic, have no idea that anything is wrong at all. It's just, I mean, I, I just, it, it's one of the best feelings ever. Do you remember when you were a baby? You were so quiet. Those were the days. Let it go, let it go, let it go. 
We got her when she was 19 months old. We got a phone call. They asked us if we would take a little girl that was prof they thought she was profound deaf. So I met Serenity in the clinic. She was such a cute little baby, and uh, we could tell that she was very smart, and she just wanted to be plugged in. She wanted to hear, and uh, we were very motivated to get her to that point where she could hear and be part of the world. Whenever I first got her, she was actually all contracted. Her thumbs were in, she was pulled up. It was a failure to thrive where she wasn't doing much. She never made a sound. You never want to think too far ahead, but I definitely had high hopes for her. I, I felt strongly that uh, we had a good chance of helping her, and it's really wonderful, I think, how she's done. So we first started testing all of her hearing, and they said that she is definitely profound deaf. You might imagine when you're this big, it's uh, very difficult to test hearing accurately because you can't participate, raise your hand, and the hearing test is normally done. And So we have various electronic ways of uh, confirming the hearing loss, and then we all meet as a team, cochlear implantation, getting the most out of your cochlear implants is definitely a team activity, so we worked very closely with the audiologist, we discussed her case, we reviewed her scans, and made sure that she was a good candidate for a cochlear implant, which uh, of course, as it turned out, she was. We had her crawling and walking before she turned two, and we got her at 19 months, so we worked really hard with her. And you can see she's come a long way, she's not a failure to thrive anymore. She's gotten bigger now. We were excited to be able to do both her implants uh, at the same time, so she just had one surgery. There's a small incision made uh, behind the ear. Surgery usually takes about two or three hours uh, per year. So with a cochlear implant, there's two components to it. There's a part that's on the inside that I put in that's underneath the skin, and then there's an outer part that looks like a traditional hearing aid that couples with the inside part with a magnet. And so when the child takes off the outer part with the magnet, uh, you can't tell that there's uh, anything on uh, the uh, inside. So the cochlear implant uh, works by taking sound and then using a computer to convert an electrical signal. And it's able to stimulate the nerves inside the inner ear, called the cochlea, uh, directly. And it sort of works like a piano keyboard. And it's able to stimulate the correct frequencies uh, that are needed to recreate uh, the speech or sound that is being uh, heard. And the surgery, my part, is actually the easy part. Really, the hard work is done by the audiologists afterwards and by the family, learning how to use the devices, retraining the brain to use the new input. When I met her, we were, you know, programming her and just kind of like teaching her to listen. They turn them on so slow, so she didn't make like any great recognition, but she would turn to me whenever I would talk to her. Right. What's a tiger? A tiger. Right. What's a kitty cat? What's a cat say? Meow. Meow. What? All of a sudden they start developing language and it's really, really an amazing, you know, an amazing thing because all of a sudden they start saying, you know, words and then all of a sudden they start saying sentences and, and now look at her, she's She's saying full sentences, she's talking, she has, you know, she's asked, it's amazing. Mom, what? go over there and read a book. You know, language and she can communicate and yeah, she's, she's really an amazing uh, example of what cochlear implants can do. She's really great. That's not a song. I'm gonna turn it to zero. The first time we were in church was probably the first time that I noticed that she could really tell a difference because she, as soon as the music started, she turned around and started looking for what that sound was and she started bouncing. And so that's when I, that was our first time that we can, What's that I really noticed first? that she could hear. What's your second? Because music is her favorite thing to do. I'm hoping that the Lord bless her with What's a voice second? because she's kind of tone deaf right now. What you so. It's always an exciting thing when a child is able to hear for the first time. The family is always very excited and, and, and grateful and uh, so like I said, it's really the, the best part of my job. You could see that with her personality, she wanted to talk and, and that was our hope and definitely that's, that was what I was, uh, you know, what I was expecting from her and she kind of blew, blew our minds. Okay, what's your brother's name? Oh, my brother is Daniel. <laughs> Daniel.
<laughs> She's interviewing you. <laughs> Cochlear implants is a lot of these kids end up being normal kids, or most of these kids end up living uh, normal lives. They go to normal schools and uh, they're just part of the hearing world. I don't think there's any limits for Serenity. She has got enough strong will and determination that I'll she will conquer anything. It, being able to hear music is really a gift. The other thing I've noticed over the years, which I found kind of surprising and didn't anticipate, is uh, particularly in older patients who had heard and then lost their hearing and then received a cochlear implant, is how many of them uh, commented that they could hear birds chirp, which is something most of us uh, take for granted um, and perhaps don't get all that much enjoyment out of it. But if you haven't heard a bird chirp in 25, 30 years, to hear it again, I hear that story over and over again, how happy people are to be able to hear the birds uh, chirp outside. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell them that your ears work? Are you happy that you have ears? Yep. Why? Because yeah, we have a wonderful cochlear implant team here at um, Cardinal Glennon and SSM and like I said, we work very closely together. Uh, we've been together uh, for over a decade and we discuss every single patient. Everyone in the room has a voice and uh, my role as the surgeon uh, is actually the easy part of the, of the whole process and uh, the real magic of using this device comes from the audiologists who tune the device and work closely with the family to get the most benefit from the device um, that, that can possibly be uh, gotten. She is just like every other five-year-old out there. A little bit more sass than others, <laughs> but yes. So when Grace was born, she was born 35 weeks. So she was a preemie. She weighed three pounds, 12 ounces. She had a feeding tube. Other than that, she was pretty healthy. So I met Grace maybe a couple of months ago. She had a white dot in each pupil. One day I noticed these little white stars. They looked like little white stars in the center of her eyes. So I asked the pediatrician, you know, like, have you ever seen this before? What is it? And so the first uh, doctor that we saw said, you know, we're gonna send you to an ophthalmologist. That ophthalmologist saw her and recommended that we take her to Cardinal Glennon to see Dr. Gabon. She was referred to me because of concerns of um, congenital cataracts. She was, I think around eight to nine weeks old at the time, so it was right at that time that we usually take out those cataracts. So we had to schedule her for surgery pretty quickly. I said, cataracts and a baby? The <laughs> next week they did her first surgery. It was like so serious. Children do get cataracts and it's not very common, but it's surprising how so many people don't know that kids can have cataracts. They can be born with them or acquire them later on. The most significant form that can lead to visual impairment later on is the congenital form when they're born with cataracts. So they removed the back lens to get the cataract out. They did her right eye first, and then they did her left eye four weeks later. If um, a baby is born with congenital cataracts that are not treated, it can cause severe amblyopia, which is visual impairment as a result of the eye and the brain not receiving a clear image uh, due to that clouding of the lens that's blocking the images from being focused on the back of the eye on the retina and being transferred to the brain. So if they, if they don't have it treated early on, their vision would not be restored. Dr. Gabon's bedside manner is amazing. She's so, she's so sweet. And she really makes you feel like you're important. We removed the cloudy lens um, in each eye. And due to her age, since she's still a little baby, we did not replace that cloudy lens with an artificial implant. So we compensate with just glasses. So she has some thick glasses on right now. After surgery, um, 
she ended up staying overnight because she's a preemie and a lot of preemies they say with anesthesia have breathing issues so they kept her overnight um, each surgery just to monitor her um, she did end up doing really well so grace is doing great i've had so many babies who've had the surgery and are now in school and are doing wonderful and i'm really expecting grace to do the same she's um, wearing her glasses very well she's doing what she's supposed to be doing at this time so i really have no concerns for grace she said it looks really good and then she did some testing on her eyes to see the prescription that she needs for her bifocal glasses. Yeah, we can tell that they can see. We have a little tricks um, before they're in there, before they're verbal. And then once they get into that stage where they can cooperate with us, we can use matching games or um, just looking at pictures and identifying pictures until they start learning their letters. But we have our tricks to tell how they can see. Yeah, you can tell that she follows us around. She's still kind of young to uh, really tell what she can and can't see. Babies are smart. They realize that they can see so much better with the glasses on. Since she doesn't have a natural lens in her eye anymore, everything is so blurred and just putting those glasses on really focuses everything for her. I was worried about the glasses. Me too. I was worried that she would be <laughs> ripping them off. So I did ask um, Dr. Gopan, am I going to be having a battle here <laughs> with these glasses? <laughs> and she told me, really, you won't. Because, you know, when she realizes that she can see with them, she won't want to take them off. And now when they're off, she throws a fit. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Gopan said that when she's a little older, that they do replace that lens that they took out so that um, she will be able to see, you know, a lot better and farther. Just we'll wait and see how, you know, technology is then. She's doing pretty well with the glasses. I usually wait till age two before we consider. But if for some reason she doesn't want to wear glasses or she's not um, cooperating with that, then we can probably do it earlier than that. So our vision is very important. Um, it's our window to the world. Without our eyes, there are so many things we won't be able to do. And knowing that helping kids develop normal vision and develop normal lives later on is so gratifying. Eyes, hearing, mm -hmm. everything. That's so important, especially when they're this young, you know, corrected as soon as possible. If we hadn't removed the cataract, she would have developed some significant visual impairment as she gets older. We need our eyes, you know, so I'm glad we corrected it when we did. It's amazing working with kids. It's so much fun. Um, they are so spontaneous and it's very rewarding um, to help kids see better, even though they don't probably know it now, but I'm sure they'll appreciate it in the future. All the hugs that we get from kids is just priceless. <laughs>the physicians that we've worked with from SLU Care, they've all been great. Whenever we walk in the building, they know Serenity. Um, whenever we're doing the checkout, the girls, before they even look us up, they're like, hi, Serenity, how are you doing today? Care for these people like they're our family. And we truly have a family environment here. It's really important from the Fetal Care Institute to the Clubfoot experience in our clinic that you really get to know the people that work with you and we all care for each other and our patients like family. It really makes it possible to make a difference in the lives of, of children, some of whom have very complex uh, issues and having all the teams uh, right there, right at uh, the child's disposal and the family's disposal, often they can have multiple visits with different uh, physicians in the same day, we can all talk to each other. It's small enough where it's really a, a community that can work uh, together to to really help the, the child and the family navigate um, uh, their childhood.
an ophthalmologist at Mercy, where we went first, recommended Dr. Godvon, and it was the best recommendation I have ever had in my life. She can hear just like we can, Never. so I don't feel like she's at a disadvantage. I feel like that she's going to conquer everything that she wants to conquer because she has her hearing. They're amazing. We had nothing but satisfying experience. It was awesome. We are able and exposed to the state-of-the-art medical care for children, and so we're so lucky to have that right at our fingertips. It's very nice to have so many different subspecialties and a great team to work with. Coordination that we really tried to provide the family so that if there are multiple issues, for Liam we have clubfoot and the heart disease, we try to coordinate things together. The providers talk closely together, and I think that's very unique in sleep care, really across specialties. We, we collaborate and, and try to make the best care for the patients. They were so compassionate about taking care of him, but also making sure that we were okay with everything and that we understood what was going on, and I can't even explain the care that we got. To get the best results, you really need a consistent team approach and that's what we have here. We can all almost complete each other's sentences and so that's really the key to getting the, the best results is, is working together. It's like you're somebody. They, they're they very interested in what is going on with your child versus just, oh, we see this all the time, you know, we're gonna do this. It's more one-on-one. -on -one and you feel the compassion from them. Kids, unlike adults, their goal in life is to play, to be active, and they don't have some of the same ideas about life or pain, and they get better, they really do. And their number one goal is to, how can I play? And it is amazing to see kids. They get better so quickly, and it's just amazing to work with them. Seeing a very challenging situation, but see them get through it and be able to have enjoy the normal things of their family and childhood, that's, I think, why most of us are here, for sure, for me. Well, I think children are the future of our society. They're the future of America. And to be able to help children when they're young and help them live a normal life, I mean, that's very uh, gratifying. I think that's what we're all about.